Hello, everyone. We are honored to be here to speak at the DAOX AI workshop. We'll be dealing today with our work entitled Knowledge Based Construction of Confusion Matrices for Multi Label Classification Algorithms Using Semantic Similarity Measures. We'll just begin by a brief introduction about our team. The University of Sfax is located in Tunisia, in North Africa, 270 kilometers from Tunis, the capital. It is a major university in Tunisia, and it is among the best universities in Africa in computer science research. The Data Engineering and Semantics Research Unit, to which we belong, is working on developing semantic technologies for real-life applications. Now, let's move to some state of the art about our work. As you presumably know, the multi-label classification evaluation algorithms are fully statistical and probabilistic. Consequently, they lack the consideration of semantic features. For instance, the confusion matrices are merely bent using pairwise evaluation methods or using Bayesian reason, which are purely statistical approaches. The use of statistical approaches does not provide advanced insights about the limitations of ML applications and how to improve them. I should quote here the saying of Radha Mihal Seya from the ACL 2021 conference. In fact, she said that the ML classification evaluation algorithms should be expanded to cover interpretability, generalizability, ethics, social good impact, reduced environmental and financial costs, and diversity and equal opportunities. In this context, classes is to provide classification as well as entities and statements in knowledge graphs are generally labeled in natural languages and have semantic values. Considering the semantic data of the output can be useful to improve the assessment of the machine learning applications. You may ask me how the construction of a precise confusion matrix can be relevant to the field of explainable artificial intelligence. In fact, there are many types of AI explainability. There is the pre-modeling explainability, the explainable modeling, and the post-modeling explainability. The construction of a confusion matrix is within the scope of post-modeling explainability, as the confusion matrix explains how pre-developed models behave and what are their limitations. So now let's move to some knowledge-driven machine learning evaluation and adjustment methods. In fact, there is a lot of work related to enabling the semantic-driven methods for adjusting or enhancing or evaluating my supervised classification algorithms. We are not the first one who thought about that, and we will show here some examples of how this is done. So to begin, we show the first example, which is the constraint-based evaluation of semantic relations. In fact, this approach evaluates if a learned semantic relation is conflicting with the constraint defined for the considered relation type in a reference knowledge graph. Where these, uh, these constraints are mainly the T box and the A box, as we are in a workshop about description logics. I will not go through that a lot, but I will clarify this method through a practical example. Let us suppose that a machine learning application has predicted that 
hepatitis C is the drug for the treatment of suppose we here. Well, here, when we leverage a knowledge graph, we know that the subject in such relation type should be a drug and the object should be a disease. When we apply the constraints to the learned relation, we find out that the relation is false because there is a subject object inversion. Let's move now to the second example. The second example deals with the hierarchical multi label classification. In fact, this method splits the multi label classification into a series of mono label classifications using Bayesian reasoning. Well, it is not using Bayesian reasoning only, but it can be using taxonomies and semantic resources to do that. Well, the outcome will be the division of the classification into a series of monolabel classifications that are more easier to handle. The monolabel classifications will, will be created so that classes in that are direct subclasses of the same parent class are put together. Let me clarify this through an example. Let us suppose that the multi-label classification algorithm considers the following classes, yellow, white, black, gray, Persian cat, Bengal cat, Munchkin cat, Scottish fall. Well, when we apply the hierarchical multi-label classification, we will generate two classifications. The first one will deal with colors, yellow, white, black, and gray. As for the second classification, it will deal with cat breeds, Persian cat, Bengal cat, Michigan cat, and Scottish fold. Another example of semantic-based method for the evaluation and adjustment of supervised classification algorithms is the inductive multi-label classification. This method adds a class to the multi-label classification output for an item when its components are recognized. For example, let us suppose that eye, nose, and mouth are recognized in a given image. We, we all know that eye, nose, and mouth are parts of face. So face should be recognized in the assessed image. Another example that is very interesting is the propensity score loss. It is a adjusted Hamming loss that does not consider the missing of a class by the assist machine learning algorithm when one of its subclasses is recognized. For example, let us suppose that an image has cat and Persian cat as labels, but the machine learning that has been applied on it has only recognized Persian cat. When Persian cat is a subclass of cat, and therefore cat is considered as if it was predicted by the algorithm. Okay, so we have now gone through the initiatives and efforts that have been done to create semantics based approaches for enhancing and evaluating multi label classification algorithms. So let's now move to our approach that uses semantic similarity measures to construct a precise confusion matrix for multi label classification models. Let me first define what are semantic similarity measures. Well, semantic similarity measures are some uh, metrics that use semantic resources. These resources can be corpora, web resources, textual resources. They can be structured semantic resources, for example, taxonomies, ontologies, semi-structured resources like Wikipedia, for example, etc. 
Well, what the semantic similarity measures will do is that they will extract features from the reference resources and use this, the, the extracted features later to compute the semantic similarity between two terms or two sentences, etc. But we will focus for this pre presentation on the semantic similarity between terms. Okay. Now more about structured semantic resources that can be used as a reference. I will give you this example. This example is a kind of a tree where each term is related to its parent class using an is a relation. The sum of all these relations and this term form the so called taxonomy. Let us suppose that there are some types of relations, and this is true, that are not taxonomic. For example, not taxonomic, autonomy, and uh, for example, veronymy, for example, uh, uh, drug used for treatment, as we said before. So this, relations will be added to this structure as a non-taxonomic relation. And this form, what is called an ontology or a semantic network. So from what we have said, we know now that there are many types of semantic similarity measures. The, some of them are using the taxonomy, the is the taxonomy. Some of them are using the semantic network or an ontology. And some of them are using a textual resource or semi-structured resource such as corpus. Well, the, the, the semantic similarity measures based on corpuses are pretty imprecise as they can give different and divergent results when the reference data set is changed. However, for the ontology and the taxonomy, the kinds of relations, semantic relations related between items are quite the same. Uh, so there, there is not a big deal about how the, the, the results can vary a lot according to the use of a resource of an ontology or another one. Okay, so given this, we see, we clearly see that the is a taxonomy based semantic similarity measures and the semantic network semantic similarity measures are better than corpus based semantic similarity measures. When we use the taxonomy based semantic similarity measures, we, we, uh, we mainly give interest to the position or the kind of topological parameters of the terms inside the taxonomy. I mean here, it can be about the shortest path between the two, uh, the two uh, terms, it can be if they have uh, some common descendants, it can be the depth of the topological uh, of uh, the two terms inside the taxonomy. It can be the ancestors, if they have common ancestors in the taxonomy, etc. So this is how a taxonomy is computed. However, the semantic network based semantic similarity measure take into consideration the topography, the, topogra uh, the topological uh, parameters, but also take into consideration some other features, for example, the non taxonomic relations. And it also take into consideration glosses in some situations. 
to compute the semantic similarity me measures. Consequently, the semantic similarity network based, the semantic network based semantic similarity measures, and particularly the feature based semantic similarity measures, are better uh, than the taxonomy based semantic similarity measures as they take into consideration many types or many kinds of semantic similarity when computing the similarity between two terms. And that's why in this work, we thought, and we, we made some tests and we found out also that the feature-based semantic similarity measures can be the best kind of semantic similarity measures that can be used for our application. In fact, we have selected the Rodriguez and Igenhofer metric for our approach in this work. Okay. Now that we have defined what are semantic similarity measures and explained why we have chosen uh, feature-based semantic similarity measures, let us explain our approach. Well, what we will do is that we will compare the semantic similarity between each predicted label and each expected label like this. And then we will compare the semantic, the semantic similarity values to check the, the association with the highest number of the highest value of semantic similarity measures. And then we will use what we get as the uh, sem semantically accurate, as, a, as I may say, associations to construct the confusion matrix label. But the association and the, the extraction and recognition of the association is a bit tricky. That's why we have come up with some rules and some heuristics to do this. Okay. So let me just start with rule one. Where the rule one says, if the number of predicted labels is superior to the number of expected label for every true label Y equal EI, we are seeing the predicted label P that returns the highest value semantic similarity between y and x as the corresponding one to the expected label y. Well, this is highlighted through the mathematical equation P equals argmax semantic similarity between x and y. Well, let me explain here. Well, let us suppose that the number of predicted labels is superior to the expected label. Well, we will, ju we will just work by row here. We'll just say, consider every expected label one by one. And for every line here, for example, expected label for, uh, for the expected label L1, we'll compute the, the semantic similarity between this L1 and the predicted labels. For example, here three, here two, two, one, one, one. And then we will choose the, the value the highest value of the computed one in this row to as the, the, the adopted or the identified association between the expected label and the predicted label. Okay, let's move now to the rule two, where the rule two deal with the other situation when the number of predicted labels is inferior or equal to the number of expected labels. For every 
predicted label P equal PY, we are seeing the expected label Y that returns the highest value of semantic similarity between P and X as the corresponding one to the predicted label. This is also highlighted by a similar uh, mathematical equation as the first one, which says that Y, uh, uh, y is equal to argmax semantic similarity between X and P. Well, the principle is the same as the first one, but expect except of uh, of using one column for the computation and not one row this means that we will just see the semantic similarities between all expected val labels and one predicted label and the and the highest value that we will get it corresponds to the, the, uh, the, the semantically accurate association between the expected and predicted labels. Okay. Let's move now to the rule three. To prevent the assignment of an association between unrelated labels, we do not consider the link between ex an expected class and the predicted class when the semantic similarity between P and why the, this means the expected class and the predicted class is inferior to the half of the sum of the minimal value and the maximal value of the semantic similarity measure. Well, we have said that because the, the thresholds and the, the, val, the, va, the maximum and minimal values of semantic similarity measures can vary according to the used metrics. For example, for the one of Rodriguez, it is between zero and three. Okay, the the the, the non consideration of uh, not semantically related uh, associations is is aims to uh, kind of uh, verify that we will not get no, no noise in the predict in the association between expected and predicted classes or to be more clear it aims to prevent some associations that are not uh, that do not make sense in the larger scale okay Let's now move to the rule four. The rule four says that when two associations involve the same expected label or the same predicted one, only the association with the highest value of semantic sim similarity measures is kept. This eliminated association should be substituted by the second sorted association according to the rules used for its recognition. Well, to explain that, let, uh, let us show uh, this example. Let us suppose that we will compute the semantic similarity as in the rule one. We'll get all the values between predicted labels and the expected and one expected label. For example, L1. We'll compute the association between the expected L1 and the predicted L1, the expected L1 and the predicted L2. And we will do the same for L4. Let us suppose that for the two rows, the highest value of the highest value of semantic similarity measures corresponded to the predicted label L4. So what we should do? This will cause an overlapping between expected label and predicted one. So the, the answer is simple. We will compare the two values between the association uh, between the expected label L, L1 and the predicted label and L4 and the expected label L4 and the predicted label L4. Adept, I suppose that the expected label 
L4 is the same as the predicted label L4. So the highest value will be for the association L4, L4. So we will just consider that, that association, and we will eliminate the association between L1 and L4. And by that, we will consider as if the association between L1, L4 does not exist. And we will continue with the remaining uh, values of semantic similarity measures and choose the highest value, the highest as, uh, the association cost, uh, corresponding to the highest value of semantic similarity measures but among the remaining associations. OK, so now we have explained the principles of our method. We will just do some preliminary tests to assess our assumption. OK, so we have created an ad hoc fabricated output for testing our proposed approach. We have done that using WordNet 3.1. Well, as you see here, so there are many levels of difficulty. So the first association just uh, substitutes German Shepherd by Belgian Shepherd. The second one, substitute the dog by wolf and German Shepherd by Belgian Shepherd. The third one, uh, substitute three labels, the uh, three labels, German Shepherd by Belgian Shepherd, dog by wolf, and domesticated animal by work animal. And the fourth example, it does not only change three, labels, but also eliminate two uh, labels as well. So we will not have predicted labels that correspond to them. And by the fourth example, we will try to find out if the missing of labels can alter the accuracy of our approach. OK, as we said before, we will use the Rodriguez and Egelhofer metric. And this will be used to align false positive with corresponding false negatives, as we said before, and create the confusion matrices for multi-label classification. Let us now move to the results. As you see in the example one, the computation was quite easy because uh, we have only substituted one label. OK, so you see the values that are three which means an absolute similarity. OK, so this is good. And for the German Shepherd, Belgian Shepherd Association, we'll find out that the semantic similarity measure could find out that German Shepherd as uh, an expected label corresponds to Belgian Shepherd as a predicted label. Let's now move to the second example. We see here that even when we substitute two labels, the, the, uh, the recognition of the association between uh, expected label and predicted label is accurate. In fact, the German Shepherd is associated to Belgian Shepherd, as you see here. This is the highest value, two. And Wolf is successfully associated to Wolf. So now let's move to the third example, which is a tricky one because we have substituted three, la three labels. So we see here that it, 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 uh, it worked accurately. And to see that our threshold was well chosen, we have seen that all the values, all the highest value for each row corresponds to a value which is superior to 1.5. And this means that the, when the, associate, the association corresponds to a semantic similarity values below 1.5, it can be just a wrong association. 
Okay, let's now move to the fourth example. The fourth example, in the fourth example, we have substituted three labels and we have eliminated two labels. And you see here, the association went well, which prove that the missing of labels by the machine learning algorithms does not affect the accuracy of our approach. Okay, as I said, this kind of association is robust to the missing of, la of labels, to the change of labels by the machine learning algorithm. And consequently, if it does this, it will be useful to construct a precise confusion matrix, as you see here, where the associations are clearly defined by contrast to pairwise evaluation made approach or to Bayesian reasoning approach. Despite the promising result of our approach, there are some limitations about this work that we would like to highlight. The first one is the lack of a specific data set to assess the multi-label classification evaluation methods. In fact, we need a specific data set that can be used to evaluate the evaluation methods and not just to train data or to uh, kind of drive some uh, artificial intelligence approaches. We we'll need the specific data set for the context of our, of assessing our evaluation approach, as well as other multi-label classification evaluation methods that will be created in the near future or in the next few years or decades. Okay. Well, the specific requirements that we needed for this work, and we did not find any data set that fulfill these requirements, is that the, the data set that we need should provide the expected classes for every item. Well, this is available in various online databases like tested ML images. The second requirement is that it should return the classes that have been predicted by a multi-label classification algorithm for every item. And this is possible by applying machine learning models on multi-label classification data sets. The third requirement is that it should map the considered classes to their corresponding concepts in an reference knowledge database, for example, an taxonomy or an ontology, so that the computation of semantic similarity measures between classes can be enabled. And the fourth requirement, and the most important one, is that it should manually align between false positives and corresponding false negatives to allow, ma to allow the development of machine learning applications for, the associate, for doing such an, uh, an association. Okay, well, the second limitation, it is not actually a limitation. Well, we explained before that we have chosen feature-based uh, metrics based on their features or their uh, characteristics and their way for the computation of semantic similarity between terms. But this is all theoretical. Well, we, could, we can, as a future direction of this work, apply our method on various types of semantic similarity measures, like path-based, loss-based semantic similarity measures. And here we have uh, a service that allows such a computation, which is available now in GitHub and developed by Dr. Muhammad Ali Hashtayeb from our team. Okay, the third thing that can be a little tricky is that, for example, if the image is blurry, for example, if the training image are of a bad quality, well, it, it may be that there, there, there some non-semantic confusions will occur. For example, a horse can be simulated to a potato 
for example, because the image is blurry. And our approach may be not very effective to highlight this. Let's now move to the conclusion. Okay, as I said, there are promising results for the use of feature-based semantic similarity measures for construction of precise confusion matrices for multi-label classification. So further development to study this method is needed through the creation of a large scale benchmark of multi-label classification evaluation. So that's all for my presentation. I would like to uh, thank you for having me here. So uh, I think I should leave the floor for question and answers. And here are my contacts. Feel free to reach me if you need further details about our work, this work or any work about semantic technologies that we are doing. Thank you.